When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Brian Bible Church. We're continuing our study through the book of John. Now, in the first four chapters of this gospel, we see very little opposition to Yeshua's teaching. In fact, in the first four chapters, he's actually gaining popularity. And in chapter 5, Yeshua was accused by the Jewish leaders of making himself equal with God. And so he responded by saying, I am equal with God in every way. And then chapter 6 opens with Yeshua's popularity really at its height. I mean, large crowds are following Him because He's been feeding the people and they want to make Him king. By the end of the chapter, the crowds are gone. They've forsaken Him because they couldn't handle His teaching. And to tell you the truth, I said this when we were in that chapter in 6, it seems like He's saying things to drive them away. They're coming to Him, He goes, unless you eat My flesh and drink My blood, you can't... And they're like, what? This guy, you know, and He's just, you know, because He's pushing the crowds away. He's not a... He's not a seeker-sensitive teacher, so to speak, okay? He's not worried about that, all right? Chapter 7 opens with the Jews seeking to kill him. And from there to the end of his public ministry, we see this deepening hostility. It just keeps getting worse and worse. In chapter 8, Yeshua gets into another confrontation with the leaders, and he says to them, You're of your father the devil. <laughs> That didn't go over too well. And at the end of the chapter, it says, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, and Yeshua himself went out of the temple. Now, on his way out of the temple, because he's being persecuted, they're trying to kill him. That's chapter 9. He sees this man who's sitting there begging, who has been blind from birth. And so he heals him. And that's pretty cool, except he healed him on the Sabbath. And so the religious leaders, they're just furious at that, that he would heal somebody on the Sabbath. The fact that this man has been born blind, blind in his life, and he gave him sight, didn't bother them at all. Didn't, they didn't even think about that or consider that. The fact that the Scriptures taught when Messiah came, he would heal the blind, they didn't put any of that stuff together. They just didn't get it. And they didn't get it because they weren't his sheep, and they hated Christ. Matter of fact, they made a law that anybody who confessed Christ as the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. You get put out. Now we need to remember that the religious leaders of the Jewish community, they exercise enormous control over their people. They ensure that the people conform to their expected rules. So when this formerly blind man believed and worshipped Yeshua, he confessed him as Messiah. So they, had, they threw him out of the synagogue. And remember, this is more than you just can't go to church here. This is everything that's connected with your life. You know, your friends are avoiding you. Well, then we come into chapter 10. Now remember I said it shouldn't be a new chapter here. What we're, everything we're doing today should be part of chapter 9. 10 should start at verse 22, but they didn't see it that way. So anyway, chapter 10 allegorically and symbolically pictures what happened to the blind man when he was cast out of the synagogue and came into fellowship with Yeshua. So what is historically laid out in chapter 9 is symbolically or allegorically laid out in the figure of the shepherd and the sheep in chapter 10. He's using these figures, these illustrations, to teach us something about his relationship. So in chapter 10, his dialogue with the Pharisees continues. And he teaches them with a parable comparing God's relationship to his covenant people with the shepherd's relationship to his sheep. So the point of verses 1 through 5 is that Yeshua is gathering a flock, a people. In verse 3 it says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He's leaving them out of the fold. In these verses, the sheepfold into which the true shepherd enters contains a, a lot of different flocks. They're not all his. Only some of the sheep belong to this shepherd. So out of this sheepfold of Israel, the true shepherd calls his own sheep. He calls them by name. And his sheep know his voice and they follow him out of the fold. This is just a simple analogy but the religious leaders didn't get it. Now, they understood the thing about sheep, but they didn't get what he's trying to teach them. This figure of speech, Yeshua spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying. Now, in spite of their knowledge of the Tanakh, the Pharisees don't get it. See, they can hear the voice of the great shepherd, 
They hear it, but they don't get it because they're not his sheep. So it's just going right over their heads. Well, then in verses 7 to 18, Yeshua shifts from the third person to the first person, I and me. He's trying to make it very specific. He makes it very clear from here on out that he's speaking of himself. He says to them, I am the door. I am the shepherd. In verses 7 through 18, they leave the sheepfold, the idea of sheepfold being Israel, and focus on the flock of the good shepherd. It's for his flock, it says, that Yeshua lays down his life. Now, in verses 7 through 10, we saw that Yeshua talked about being the door. And we talked about, you know, they, when they made a sheep pen out in the wilderness, they would build this pen and the shepherd would actually sleep in the entranceway. No sheep could go unless they go over him. No intruders can get in unless they go over him. So Yeshua taught us that he's the door. Well, verses 11 20 through 21 now he gives us the third part of this series of analogies or parables about an eastern shepherd and the lives they live. And you've got to remember, this is said in light of the healing of the blind man of chapter 9. All this is illustrating what happened there. So verses 11 through 18 changes the metaphor from Yeshua as a door to Yeshua as a shepherd. The metaphors change, but we get that the shepherd was the door. All right, They played the same role. All right, Now, the Lord uses the figure of speech of a shepherd and his sheep because he's so much like a shepherd and we are so much like sheep. That's not really complimentary, but it's just true. Okay, it's just true. We're like the sheep. One thing the shepherd suggests is it suggests ownership. All right, the sheep belong to him. In the east, the shepherds were almost always owners of the flock. And that makes me think of what Paul said in Corinthians. We are bought with a price. He owns us. It also suggests fellowship, the idea of a shepherd, because the shepherd was always with the sheep. He's, that night, he's sleeping in the pen with them. He's with them all day long. They're constantly together. And it's a good thing he's always with them because sheep are helpless. They're some of the most helpless of all the animals. So the shepherds have to take care of everything for them. So a shepherd speaks of care, it speaks of feeding, it speaks of protection. He leads them out to water and pasture. He leads them in to protection. He is constantly caring for them. You know, another thing about sheep that makes them like us is sheep are prone to wander. They're constantly leaving the fold. They're constantly walking away from the flock. And the shepherd has to keep them in or go after them and get them and bring them back. Now, I'm sure you're aware. I mean, maybe you're not aware of this. But um, as Christians, we are prone to wander. Now, as young Christians, we, we think we got it all together. We're good. And then as you mature, you realize, you know, I'm really prone to wander. And I think the songwriter, Robert Robinson, got it right. In his hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. There's a line in there, it's prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Because there's so, we're just, we're prone to wander away. Why? You know, you wonder why the Lord is so good to us, He's done so much, and yet we constantly are, are prone to wander. And we're like sheep who have gone astray. And the Lord has to keep us, He's got to take care of us. So Yeshua says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So here the figure changes from the door. Now he becomes the shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. He's here, identifies himself with the very significant words, I am. This is ego, Amy, which reminds us or should, of Yahweh's revelation of Himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. You know, Moses is there, who shall I say sent me? He says, Ehiah, share Ehiah. I am who I am. That's who sent me. Now in John's Gospel, Yeshua will use these words, I am, ego, Amy, 26 times. And in seven different metaphors, each metaphor used with a predicate nominative. And today He's saying, I am the Good Shepherd. So the Lord Yeshua here claims to be the I Am of the Tanakh. The one who is the beginning. The one who is the end. The one who is the first and the last. The one who is the Aleph Tav. I am He. 
So when the Jews heard Yeshua say, I am, they couldn't help but reflect that this person is making claims to deity. That really upset them. They kept catching this and they, get, they just got upset about it. They didn't like it. You can't do that. You're a man. So he said, I am the good shepherd. He's not only the I am, he also says, I'm the good shepherd. Now the emphasis here is, I am the shepherd, the good one. And there are basically two or two predominant Greek words that can be translated good. One is agathos, which is usually used in John for things, good things. This is the word kalos, which was used in the Septuagint to refer to good as opposed to evil. In the New Testament, kalos has the meaning of beautiful, noble, moral, and worthy. He's the worthy shepherd. He's the noble shepherd. Now, the shepherd concept, we talked about this, is part of God's self-revelation in the Tanakh. All right. If you're going through reading the Tanakh, you find our Lord over and over saying He is the shepherd of Israel. So those listening to Yeshua would have thought of the prophecy of Ezekiel 34, particularly verses 9 through 12. Let's look at those verses again. Ezekiel 34, 9. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh. Behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherd will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. He's going to do this. I myself, it's Yahweh speaking, I'm going to take care of my sheep. I'm going after them and take care of them. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep. I will care for my sheep and I will deliver them from all the places which they were scattered on the cloudy and gloomy day. Now this role in Ezekiel is depicted as fulfilled by Yahweh. But in our text, Yeshua says, I'm the good shepherd. So again, he's claiming deity. He's telling those Jews that he was Yahweh. Because they knew Psalm 23, Yahweh is my shepherd. They knew Psalm 80, where Yahweh is referred to as the shepherd of Israel. So when Yeshua says, I'm the good shepherd, again, he's saying, I'm God. And by using the tetragrammaton, the yod heh the I am here, he says, I'm claiming to be the good shepherd. This is a double claim to deity. I am is deity. Shepherd, deity. Both of these point to deity. He says, I'm the good shepherd. What he's trying to tell them, listen people, he's telling them, he's telling us, I am Yahweh in the flesh. This is God fleshed out, dwelling on the earth. Now what does it mean to us that God, that Yeshua, is our shepherd? I mean, we have to do this by academics. We have to learn what a shepherd and sheep is because we don't have a lot of this experience. But we, we can read and so we can understand what the shepherd's sheep... Well. As we said, first of all, he's the owner of the sheep. Okay, And as the owner of the sheep, he's responsible for the care of the sheep. A shepherd was absolutely responsible for the care of those sheep. And the thing about Yeshua as a shepherd that's comforting to me is he's never off duty. Okay, He doesn't have holidays. He doesn't get any vacation time. There's no 8 to 5. He is always with the sheep. When we're in the pen, He's at the door. He's sleeping. He's protecting. He leads us out in the day to pasture land, to water. The shepherd of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, so He's always on duty, always watching over us. He's the noble shepherd, always watching over His flock. Then He says this, the good shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. This is the first of five times in this text that He repeats His willingness to to lay down his life for the sheep. He says in verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. He says it in 17, I lay down my life. 18a, I lay it down on my own initiative. 18b, I have authority to lay it down. This is the stress, people, of this text we're looking at. The emphasis here is Yeshua, the shepherd, willing to lay down his life for his sheep. 
It dwells upon His care for the sheep and His willingness to die for them. Now, that would have been rare for the Palestinians because ordinarily their shepherds didn't face death when shepherding and caring for the sheep. Now, we have some instances of that in the Tanakh. David, for example, risked his life to care for the sheep. He was a shepherd. He wrestled with bears. He wrestled with lions. But that was comparatively rare. You didn't expect the shepherd to lay down his life, to have to die for the sheep. All right? Now, in the context of the shepherd caring for the sheep analogy, why would Yeshua's statement be shocking to the crowd listening to him? Why would his statement about, I'm going to lay down my life, be shocking to this crowd? What happens if the shepherd dies? Yeah, who takes care of the sheep? The sheep are vulnerable. The sheep are in danger. They're at risk. That shepherd is everything. So if the shepherd dies, wait a minute, if you lay down your life, who's taking care of these sheep? I mean, they wouldn't, that would have been stunning to them. It's disastrous for the sheep. They wouldn't make it. They would not survive without the shepherd. They'd wade into water that was moving. The wool would be weighted down and they would drown. They'd eat things they shouldn't. They're just not too smart, people. That's why they're like us. Okay? He said, the text says he lays down his life. Now, the Greek expression is unusual here. The word translated lay down literally means to put or to place. Our expression to put one's life on the line would be a close expressing the risk that's implied by this phrase. But this same construction is used in the Greek version of 1 Kings 19.2 to mean death rather than just risk. This means much more than Yeshua risking his life. Laying down his life is a unique Johannian expression that describes a voluntary sacrificial death. He's saying, I'm going to die for the sheep. Now we'll see later that he's also going to rise for them, so that's why he can still be the shepherd and care for the sheep. All right, It's not just about death. He lays down his life. Here, this is not the Greek word bios for life, which would refer to physical side of life. And he didn't use the word zoe here, which John uses of eternal life. Instead, he uses the Greek word suke, which means soul, the totality of his being, the essence of his life. This means that Yeshua loves the sheep so much that he gave himself completely, utterly, totally for those sheep. Believer, if there's anything that proves Yeshua's love for the sheep, it's his fact that he dies for them. You know, and when I hear a believer say, I'm just not sure God loves me, then just look at Calvary. That's the expression of love. He died for his sheep. Now, it's talking about his sacrificial atoning death, which wasn't an accident. The shepherd wasn't a helpless victim in the popular sense of that term today. He wasn't overcome by his adversaries. His death was by his own will and purpose. It was an obedience to the Father's will. His death was proposed by Him to save all those whom the Father had given Him. Now what's interesting here is that the Good Shepherd in this text is also the Lamb of God in John 1.29. The Good Shepherd laid down His life by becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's the shepherd, and he's the dying lamb. And he does this for the sheep. Now, this is an important expression, so I'm going to read D.A. Carson's words here because I think they're really insightful. The words for, which is the Greek huper, the sheep, suggests sacrifice, he says. The preposition itself, ambiguous in John, always occurs in a sacrificial context whether referring to the death of Jesus or a man prepared to die for his friends. In no case does this suggest a death which was merely exemplary significance. In each case, the death envisioned is on behalf of someone else. The shepherd does not die for his sheep to serve as an example, throwing himself off a cliff in a grotesque and futile display while bellowing, See how much I love you! No, the assumption is that the sheep are in mortal danger. And that's what we have to understand. The reason the shepherd is dying is because these sheep are in danger of eternal damnation. 
And something has to happen. They're in mortal danger that in their defense, the shepherd loses his life. In other words, he dies so the sheep can live. His death, by his death, they are saved. That and that alone is what makes him the good shepherd. So Christ died for, who pair, for the sheep on behalf of them, for their benefit. And that's what Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him, referring to Christ, who knew no sin. See, that's why he could die for us. He was sinless. He didn't have any sin of his own to die for. He didn't have to die. He died for us. He made to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Christ takes our sin, bears it on the cross, gives us His righteousness. Who pair appears to be in a lot of passages that speak about the substitutionary atonement of Christ. He took our place. He died for us. And one thing the Bible makes plain is that the Lord Yeshua is the substitute in the sense that He bore the penalty. He takes our place in order that we might be delivered from the penalty of sin. He bears all the judgment of our sin. Listen, Yeshua exhausted the wrath of God against us. Your sin debt has been paid in full. Heaven itself can bring no further charges against you because it's paid. And that's why we have to understand the security of our salvation. How can I ever lose? I'm paid in full forever. I can never go in debt again. Because the sinless Son of God paid my debt in full. Amen. It's an incredible concept, people. The sin debt is paid. So many people today think Yeshua was a failure. He paid part of it. He paid some of it. You've got to help him out. He doesn't need your help. Okay? Not at all. He died for the sheep. The sacrificial death of the good shepherd described here is not, listen, is not for sheep in general. He doesn't die for all the sheep in the sheepfold of verses 1-5. through five. He dies for His sheep. The sheep of His flock. The elect whom the Father has given Him. Now, there's a lot of controversy in the Christian church. Always has, always will have been over whether the Lord's death is a general atoning death or whether it is particular. That is, did Yeshua come to, for the purpose of dying for all men? To save all men? Or did He come with the design and purpose of saving the elect? And good men have held positions on both sides of this issue. I think the biblical position is that He came to die with the design of saving the elect. The design of the atonement is definitely restricted. Yeshua dies for those who have been given to Him by the Father. This is the teaching throughout the fourth Gospel. It's also the doctrine, I think, of the rest of Scripture. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 605 states this. The church, following the teaching of the apostles, I don't think they're really doing that in this instance, affirms that Jesus died for all humanity without exception. There is not, never has been, never will be a single human being for whom Christ did not suffer. Well, the problem with that is it goes totally against the teaching that we've seen so far in the Gospel of John. Totally against it. And, and most of the church holds this position right here. Most of the church. They're certainly not following the teaching of the apostles. Look what we saw already in John 6.44. Listen. Get these words. No one can come to me. Well, who can come? Nobody. Not anybody. Unless, oh, there's a condition. What's the condition? Unless the Father who sent me draws him. And some people say, well, the Father draws everybody. Well, look at the last phrase. And I'll raise him up at the last day. Then everybody gets raised. This is universalism. Everybody gets saved. That's not what it's teaching. All that Yeshua died for will come to him and they will be raised from the dead. But all are not drawn by the Father and all are not raised from the dead so Christ didn't die for all. John 10.26 But you do not believe. Why? Because you're not my sheep. 
See, my sheep hear my voice and they follow. You're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe. Christ died only for His sheep, not for all sheep. Obviously, some sheep are lost. That's the whole thing of this shepherd thing we're seeing here. He called out of the fold His sheep. All right, our text goes on to say in verse 12, He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who was not the owner of the sheep. Now, we said mostly the shepherds were owners. This guy's this guy a hired hand. Wait, will you watch my sheep for me? I'll give you so and so much money. Okay, sure, I'll do that. All right? He sees a wolf coming. He doesn't have a gun. He's got a staff about it. And he goes, hey, I don't think this is worth it. All right, so he leaves the sheep and he flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Now, this is a little bit different because, it, you know, in this text we've talked about thieves and robbers coming to get the sheep. This hireling is not really a bad guy, so to speak. All right, he's got good intentions. He's been hired to watch the sheep. He's supposed to protect them. However, it's just come to the point where this is too costly. They're not my sheep. I'm not going to risk my life, and I'm bailing. And so he just does. He bails. And push comes to shove, he just gets out of there. And verse 13 says, he flees because he's a hired hand. He's not concerned about the sheep. The cost is too high for a hired hand. You know you know that on your job. Sometimes it just gets to be too much. You're like, I'm not getting paid enough to do this stuff. I'm out. I can't handle it anymore. Hopefully you got another one before you do that. But you know, that's, what, that's what people do. But the hireling just, I'm not risking my life, so he leaves. Well, the shepherd, they're his sheep. They belong to him. He cares for them. He knows them. We talked about this before. They would actually name their different sheep. They knew them very well. But this hireling's got no emotional attachment to the sheep. Times of inconvenience, danger. He just leaves. And again, in verse 14, he says, I'm the good shepherd. Compared to this hireling, you know, this guy takes off, I'm the good shepherd. For a second time, he identifies himself as Yahweh, the good shepherd of Ezekiel 34. And he says, I know my own, and my own know me. Now, know here is the Greek gnosko. All right? In this gospel, it means more than a cognizance of mere facts. In other words, I know this, I know that. No, it implies a relationship of trust and intimacy. See, this is the knowledge in the sense of covenant relationship. This goes all the way back to Genesis 4.1. It says, Adam knew his wife, and they had a child. So knowing means more than, oh, that's, I, I recognize her. She's, you know, she's my wife. Yeah, I guess you would recognize her. There weren't a lot of other women around at the time. But when he says he knew her, it's an intimate relationship. It produced a child. Now, the promised new covenant of Jeremiah 31.31 31 promises that all God's people will know Him. Look at 31.34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they will all know Me. For the least of them to the greatest. What's this talk about? This is talking about within the new covenant. Within the old covenant, you had a covenant community. In that covenant community, some people knew the Lord. It was like a cross section of a peach. Cut a peach in half, you got the pit. The pit is the believers, and all the meat, those are the unbelievers, but they're all in the covenant community of Israel. Within that covenant community, you had believers and non believers. The new covenant is like a cross cut of a potato. We're all believers in the new covenant. Everybody in there is a believer. So we don't go to other people in the new covenant and say, hey, know the Lord. We all know Him. We've got that knowledge. It comes with our faith when we trust in Him. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh. For I'll forgive their iniquity and their sin I'll remember no more. So we don't go to each other. We go outside the covenant to call believers to faith. And the intimacy of the sheep-shepherd relationship is grounded upon the intimacy of the Father and Son. That's what he says in the next verse. He says, he says, I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, he knows his sheep perfectly. He knows us as the Father knows him, and the Father knows him perfectly, so he knows us perfectly. Listen, he knows our fears. He knows our trials. In fact, He knows every thought we think. It's not too comforting sometimes, huh? The intimacy of Yeshua's care for us, of His church, is not simply that of a shepherd for the sheep, but the same kind of the intimate relationship shared by Christ and the Father. Now, Yeshua doesn't mean that our relationship with Him 
is just as intimate as his relationship with the Father. That'd be impossible. The comparison means that our relationship with the Good Shepherd is reciprocal. Just like him and the Father love each other, our relationship between him and us is reciprocal. We love each other. And he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, the second time, he promises, I'm going to die for the sheep. You know why? Because the sheep need someone to die for them. Verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice. They will become one flock and one shepherd. Now this verse carries us back to verses 1 through 5. And there the sheep pen represented what? Judaism. Yeshua is calling people out of Judaism, right, to himself, calls his own sheep out of that fold, and he, this, he develops his own flock. Now the sheep that remain in the pen are unbelieving Jews. If Yeshua has other sheep that are not of that sheep pen, who are these other sheep? They're Gentiles. They're not Jews. They're not out of Israel. They're not selected from that pen. They've got to be Gentiles. That's your own other choice. Okay? I think this is an allusion to Isaiah 56, 6 through 8. It says, also the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh. These are non Israelites. They're joining themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenants, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. My house will be called a house of prayer for all people, not just Israel. The Lord Yahweh who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. That's just what he's saying in our text. In John, I got others that do. The others are the Gentiles who will be gathered into the Messiah's flock alongside the restored sheep of Israel. This recalls the mission of the Son we saw in John 3.16. For God so loved Israel. Is that what it says? No. The world, meaning Israel and the Gentiles. I love the whole world. It doesn't mean I love every single person in the world, but I love the world. Jews and Gentiles both. It was not just for the nation Israel. Speaking of Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, John 11 says this, now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua is going to die for the nation. What nation? Israel. He's going to die for his people, the nation Israel. But watch this. And not for the nation only. Oh, he's dying for somebody else? Who? In order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. It's not just the nation Israel. He's going to gather the children from the Gentile lands. He's going to bring them all together. Yeshua says they will become one flock with one shepherd. So do we got a messianic flock and a Christian flock over here? No, we have one flock with one shepherd. Now listen to me. There are numerous Bible teachers who deny this. They say, oh no, there's not just one flock. There's two distinct purposes, two distinct peoples of God and two distinct purposes of God. God has a purpose for His earthly people, Israel, and He has a different purpose for His spiritual people, the church. That denies what this says right here. There's one flock with one shepherd. John Hagee, I think you know who he is, right? Founder, senior pastor of Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. It's a non-denominational megachurch. He says they have a t regular 20,000 attendees. 20,000. Yeah, that's close to what we got here. But the idea, yeah. But here's the thing. It says his TV and radio ministry speaks worldwide to, into 99 million homes. All right, now I say that because I want you to understand he's got a big impact. He's got the ear of the president. He talks to the president, you know. And it's a sad thing. is a mess, okay? He thinks he's a proponent of this two peoples, two destinies. The Houston newspaper quoted John Hagee as saying this, I'm not trying to convert the Jewish people to the Christian faith. Well, then what's he saying? 
Here's what he is saying. To hell with the Jews. He didn't get that, but that's what he's saying. He goes on to say, in fact, trying to convert Jews is a waste of time. The Jewish person who has his roots in Judaism is not going to convert to Christianity. There is no form of Christian evangelism that has failed so miserably as evangelizing the Jewish people. They already have a faith structure. Everyone else, whether Buddhist or Baha, needs to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God which has never been replaced by Christianity. So according to John Hagee, Jews don't need to believe in Yeshua. Now let me ask you a question here. So far in our study of the Gospel of John, we've gone through ten chapters almost, who in this Gospel is Yeshua telling they need to believe in Him? Who are all His followers? Who are all His disciples? But they don't need to believe in Him, Hagee says. For ten years, nothing in the church but Jews. It took them ten years to get outside and start reaching out. And Hagee said, they don't need to believe. Well, I beg to differ with you, but my Savior Yeshua would argue with that. Because what did Yeshua tell the Jews? Unless you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. You can't come to the Father except through Me, He says. So they don't have a system. Since Christ showed up on the earth and began to preach, the Jews either trust Him or they're lost. They have no relationship to God. You can't come to God apart from Christ. We've been over and over this. And yet people sit there by the millions listening to this man's garbage and buy it. Because we're dumb sheep. <laughs> and the shepherd's leading them astray. The Bible teaches there is one people of God. All believers, listen, all believers, Jewish believers, Gentile believers, share in the promises God made to Abraham. So Israel is said to share in the promises. That's what their promises, their covenant promises. The church of Yeshua is said by the apostles in the New Testament to share the promises God made to Abraham. That is the teaching of Ephesians. That's the teaching of Romans. That's the teaching of the New Testament. God has taken two peoples and made them one. In Genesis chapter 12, we have the first account of the promises that God gave to Abraham. God calls Abraham because he's tired of everybody else. Sorry. I mean, the, the people just will not follow him. The, the last straw was they built the Tower of Babel, so God's just at the point, he's like, I'm done with people. I'm just going to divorce you all. I'm going to turn you all over to other gods, and I'm going to go on and start a new thing. And the new thing he started was, he said, Abraham, come on, I'm going to make you something special. I'm going to make a nation out of you. He says, now Yahweh said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Israel, he's going to make a nation Israel out of Abraham. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so shall be, you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God had just divorced himself from all the rest of the families. And the first thing he does when he calls Abraham is tells him, I'm going to get them back. I'm going to get those families back also, but I'm starting with you. It's going to work through you. And the original Abrahamic promises, blessing, were promised to the Gentiles. Then later in the Tanakh, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 42, which you know, that prophet Isaiah speaks of the ministry of the suffering servant of Yahweh, the Messiah. He says he's going to have a ministry to the Gentiles. He says, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the nations. You're going to reach out to the nations. And in chapter 49, verse 6, the second of the songs of the suffering servant of the Messiah, we read this. He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. Now get that. He's raising up the tribes of Jacob. That's Israel. Restore the preserved ones of Israel. That is the people of God, Israelites. 
But he also says, I will also make you a light to the nations. It's not Israel only. So that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Then if you look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 8, he tells us that the Lord Yeshua came and His first responsibility was to confirm the promises made to the fathers. But then he says in verse 9, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for His mercy. See, the Gentiles are to glorify God by coming to faith in Christ. God's purpose is to glorify Himself through the salvation of His elect from every nation through the seed of Abraham, who is the seed of Abraham, Yeshua the Christ. Now, there's a lot of people in the preterist community that deny that Gentiles even have anything to do with the covenant or promises or blessings. It's all just to Israel and Israel only. And they, they try to, you know, we dealt with this. And I just want to say, because there's more to this. If you want to look into it, uh, there our series on Ephesians, we have two messages entitled, Who are the Gentiles? And I want you to see that the promises of God, the Gentiles have always been part of that. Always been part. From the very beginning of the call of Abraham, all the way through, we've always been part. But there's some people who say, no, that's just Israel, and if you're not an Israelite, you got nothing to do with it. And I'm like, then you must take your ball and go home, because there ain't nothing about playing here. You the playing field's over. You know, it's done. If it's only to Israel. But it's not. We've always been, and I thank God that Gentiles got included right off the bat, okay? So Yeshua, the good shepherd, says this, I have other sheep. And I want you to get this here. He doesn't say, I'm going to get some other sheep. He doesn't say, I will have some other sheep. He says, I have them. So who are these sheep that he already has? Well, the Gospel of John makes it very plain that the, one of the important truths is that the Father has already given certain individuals to the Son. This is a concept that we have to understand, people, because it's all through this Gospel. You've got to get this. Look at 637. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Now I want you to notice the Father has given to the Son certain individuals. In other words, it's a gift to the Son. Son, I have a gift. You're going to die. Four people, and I have a gift for you. Here's what you get for dying. You get the elect. It's a gift. I'm giving these to you. They're going to come to you. Look at 65. And he was saying, For this reason I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. The ones who come, come because they've been given to the Son from the Father. Look at John 17, 1-3. Yeshua spoke these things, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You, even as You have authority over all flesh. And to all whom You have given Me, He may give eternal life. Now Christ gives eternal life only to those who the Father gave Him. That's what it says. All you gave me, everyone that you gave me, I gave eternal life. Yeshua prays to His Father in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me. He gave them some people out of the world. They were yours, they belonged to the Father, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. So God chose these sheep for Himself. They were yours. He had chosen them from the foundation of the world. And He gave them to the Son. He said, you gave them to Me. So the Son is receiving a love gift from the Father of the elect. So when Yeshua says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, He's referring to those who are not in the fold of Judaism. He says He has them not because they're already believing in Him, but because they've been given Him by the Father. It's an eternal gift of the Father to the Son, and that seals the title of their redemption. They are His sheep. The fact that they are given by the Father is the important thing here. Listen, they will come to Christ in history as they hear the Gospel at a particular point, and they will respond by believing. Why? Because they've been given by the Father. They're going to come. 
He says, I must bring them also. This is the must of divine necessity. The Father has chosen them. I will lay down my life for them and I will bring them. In other words, there's no question. They'll be brought. It's not possibility that the Father would choose a flock for His Son, give them to His Son, and yet the Son couldn't bring them. The salvation of Christ's sheep must take place. I must bring them also. And they will hear My voice. And again, this speaks of the certainty of their response. In this chapter, that He makes this statement more than once. All right, he says in verse 4, the sheep will follow me because they know my voice. Then later on in chapter 18, speaking with reference to Pilate, he says this. Now, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. See, the sheep, they hear it, they follow. Because they know he's his. Now in reference to Pilate in 18, he says this. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you're a king? Yeshua answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born, and for this I've come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. In 10.26 he says this, you do not believe. Why don't they believe? Because you're not my sheep. Listen, please get this distinction. Believing doesn't make you part of the flock. I'm out here. I believe I'm going to bring you in the flock. Being part of the flock enables you to believe. You've got to be part of the flock first. And that's God's work. He calls you into the flock. Believing shows that you are from you're His from the foundation of the world because He called you into His flock. He took that flock. He gave it to His Son. Those heard His voice, they followed. Yeshua is saying that those who belong to Him will listen to his voice. Now listen, he's standing here in front of these Pharisees. And he's saying that the ones who belong to me, they hear my voice. That had to cut very deeply. Because his audience, these Pharisees, assume they know God. They're representatives of God. They stand here in the presence of one who identifies himself as Yahweh, and they don't have a clue who he is. They refuse to listen to His voice. The only conclusion is, they're not His sheep. They don't belong to Him. And that's why they're not going to hear His voice. He says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so I may take it again. Now the statement that the Father loves Yeshua because the Son is laying down His life doesn't mean that Yeshua earns the Father's favor by His love, by His sacrificial death. Rather, Laying down Yeshua's life for a sheep is the act which expresses the perfect accord between them. This is the Father's will. I'm doing this in the will of the Father. I delight in this. There's a perfect accord there between them. Verse 18, he says, No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. Now, superficially, Observers look at what happened with Christ and they would conclude Yeshua died because the Jews conspired against Him. However, Yeshua revealed that behind the instrumental cause was the efficient cause of God's sovereign will. And we see this in Acts chapter 4. For truly in this city, Jerusalem, they were gathered together against your holy servant Yeshua, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Guess what? All these people came together and they did just exactly what you planned from eternity to happen. Think, oh no, they're killing him. And guess what? This was always God's plan. It's always His plan for the shepherd to die for the sheep. He says, I lay it down on my own initiative. Yeshua is not speaking about His death as some unfortunate accident. Nor is He speaking as one who will die because of the wickedness of brutal men or others. He speaks here of a deliberate, authoritative, purposeful laying down of his life. It's an action totally under his control. This deliberate dying is followed by the equally deliberate, authoritative, and purposeful restoration of life. He says, I have authority to take it up again. This is just another proof of divinity. Only God can take and give life. 
But Yeshua said, I'll lay it down, but I'm coming back. This prophecy was fulfilled in the cross, His sacrifice, and His resurrection from the dead three days later. He laid down His life. He took it up. Now after that, what do you think these people who heard Him say this were thinking? Well, this guy said He had authority to lay down His life, and He had authority to take it back. And He rose from the dead, and they're like, this is incredible. You know what's interesting is the New Testament writers attribute Yeshua's resurrection to all three members of the Trinity. He says, I have authority to take it up again. You should say, I'm taking up my own life. Well, the resurrection is said to be the work of the Father in Romans 6.4, the Son in John 2.19, and the Spirit in Romans 8.11. Trinity, in, intimately involved in all the works that God does. Now, this verse should give us as believers comfort. Because we understand that the Lord is our shepherd. Well, He's a sovereign shepherd. Shepherd. He lays down his life in order that he may rise from the dead. He who is life, who is the source of all life, cannot have his life taken away against his will. He can't be defeated. Listen, they killed our shepherd. All right, in the human world, that's the worst you can do to anybody. You kill them, that's it, right? They're done. They killed him. They exercised the full power of Rome and they put him to death. Well, what happened? He came right back out of the grave. That's power. Rome couldn't touch him. Death couldn't touch him. That's a sovereign shepherd. And listen, people, as his sheep, we're secure. Something could happen to your shepherd. You know, a wolf could attack. He could lose his life somehow out there in the desert. Whatever, he could die. But our shepherd has power over life and death. And he's defeated death. And he's promised life for all who believe in him. He's always available to care for his sheep. Because he's got the power of life and death. Now, John Piper, whom I normally criticize, this I'm, I'm agreeing with him here. I want you to know that ahead of time. So you, you're going in the right direction. Okay, I agree with him. All right, and I think John's got some good things to say. I just have a problem with some of his lordship stuff. But he lays out our security of salvation, and he writes this. I thought it was excellent. He says, "Mark this chain of security. Those whom the Father chose for Himself. That's a group. The Father chose them. I choose this group right here." He says. He also gave to the Son. He chose a group, gave that group to the Son. And for those who belong to the Son, that group He gave Him, He also laid down His life. And those for whom He laid down His life, He also called to Himself. And those whom He called heard His voice, and they followed Him. And to those who followed Him, He gave eternal life. And those to whom He gave eternal life can never be taken from His hand. We'll look at that further in this text. And there will be one flock and one shepherd forever. This is how secure you are. This is how solid your salvation is. Do you get it? Do you see the unbroken chain? And all you got to do is read this in Romans chapter 8. The same thing is laid out. It's an unbroken chain. It starts with the Father choosing. And if the Father chooses to get to the you're glorified. Because all the Father chooses come to Him. That's just how it works. Now in closing this section, Lazarus, Lazarus gives us the reaction of the crowd to Yeshua's teaching. So it says the division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Now in 10.6, the response of the listeners was, we don't get it. It was just a lack of understanding. Here... There's division. All right, the crowds, some crowds say, yeah, that makes sense. Other crowds say, ah, this guy's crazy. Now, the expression the Jews here in this gospel usually refers to the leaders. Here it's more a general, just the Jews. All right? The Jews in general. They're dividing up because of this. And one part said, many of them were saying, he has a demon. He's insane. Why do you listen to him? Why would they say that about him? What, yeah, I mean, what's he doing that's so demonic? He's saying He's God. He's claiming to be God in the flesh. And they're like, you've got to be crazy. How can a man say, I am the Good Shepherd? You've got to be demon-possessed. You've got to be out of your mind to make those statements. But the rest of the crowd was going, well, these are not the sayings of one demon-possessed. A demon can't open the eyes of the blind, can he? See, here we go back to John chapter 9 and the blind man. I told you this is all the same context here. Many thought he's crazy or possessed. And some are saying... If he was, how did he give sight to the blind? 
I mean, they're just using their God-given mind to say, this doesn't add up, okay? Yeah, he's saying some crazy things, but, you know, listen, we know from Scripture that when Messiah comes, he will heal the blind. This man claims to be Messiah, and he heals the blind. Maybe we should think about this a little bit, all right? They knew that God Himself had the ability to overcome blindness, Psalm 146.8. So this connects us back to 9 again. He's given sight. So the crowd is divided now. Some say, he's just a demon. We've got to kill him. We've got to get rid of him. Others are saying, wait a second. Demons don't do this kind of stuff. And what's sad here, but what it helps, should help us to see clearly this whole idea of election and choosing. Seeing the miracles... Watching a blind man give in sight, and plenty of people knew this guy, it had no effect on the people who weren't his sheep. They just said, he's nuts, he's crazy, we don't, we, don't, you know, we don't buy it. But to his sheep, they heard his voice, and they followed. Believers, in times of trial, I want you to remember this, Yahweh is my shepherd shall not want. He's the shepherd. He cares for the sheep. Listen, He gave His life to buy the sheep. He gave His life to protect the sheep. We're His and He cares about us. And it's a concept we have to keep in mind. A shepherd who never slumbers, a shepherd who never sleeps, a a shepherd who is sovereign over every event in time, He's my shepherd. I'm not going to want. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for this beautiful passage. Lord, and there's so much more to go. I just pray You'd give us wisdom. Help us, Lord, us Westerners to connect with this idea of sheep and a shepherd. Help us to see, Father, how much, how intimately the shepherd cares and knows his sheep and how he's willing to lay down his life for those sheep. Father, teach us as we look at these analogies, as these illustrations. Teach us how much You love us, Your sheep. And Father, I pray You'd help us to come to a solid conviction of our eternal security. Understand that You have chosen us in eternity past. You have given us to the Son. We are His sheep. He laid down His life for us. Thank You, Lord, for Your grace. Thank You for the confidence we have in You, knowing that our salvation is all about You and Your love for us. It's not about our performance. It's not about our deeds. It's not about the things we accomplish. It's about who our shepherd is. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen. Any comments, questions? Gary. Well, in answer to your first request today, I learned something. Okay, good. Good prayer, Jeremy. Your prayer was answered. Gary learned something. Um, You can't teach an old dog new tricks, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Although it's something I knew, but you expressed it today in a way I've never heard stated that really helped the perspective and that Christ exhausted God's wrath for us. And that was just, uh, I've never heard it put that way and that really, like there's no wrath left to dispense on us. There isn't. There is no wrath. Heaven has dispensed all its wrath on the Son of God, on the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. He paid the full debt. You know, if we could just grab that, you know, I mean, you know, I get the fact that we realize, you know, I'm a sinner and I sin and we feel bad when we sin. I think we should, you know, but we still have to understand in, in an eternal sense, it's paid for. God paid it all. There's a hymn, something like that, isn't it? Jesus paid. All to Him we owe. All to Him we owe. It, it didn't, he didn't pay some of it. And that's what most of the church believes. He paid a good portion of my debt, but I'm working off the rest. Right. No, there's no payment plan, people. Okay? <laughs> if you owe a debt, you're on your way to... We are still supposed to be a light to other people, I think, and show them that we're different. Absolutely. And we've gone over and over this, Okay. Listen, we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about how do we get eternal destiny? We get that by God's work in His Son. Now, does that mean we don't have to obey or do? No. How you live affects this life, your time here. 
If you follow, we just talked about this a couple weeks, maybe it was last week. Was it last week? You need to obey the Lord. You need to walk and, and you need to be a light to others. And if you're not doing that, there's consequences here and now. But our salvation is never threatened. That's secure. That's a done deal. You're a child, you're getting in. As a child, you might get spanked a lot before you get there. Okay? Because he spanks his children. Hebrews 12. He spanks his children. He chastens them when they need it. He's not afraid to do that. But he never says, oh, you've been so bad, you're not my child anymore. No. And that's why, you know, the song we sing, Call It Grace. Really? Someone's calling me? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> we, we sing that song, Call It Grace. And it says, we were orphans who've had crowns placed upon their head. Now, I want you to think about that. An orphan. They don't even have a mom or a dad. No one's there to love them. Christ has taken orphans and made us kings. What an incredible thought. We're, that's who we are now. We have crowns because we're children of the king. We've gone from orphans to kings. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible thought. Gary Cole from Texas says, Anita's sister is here with us today and has asked, does God only choose certain people, the elect to be saved, and gave only them to Christ? Yes. Absolutely. Out of the mass of humanity, God chooses some. You say, well, that's not fair. Take it up with God. I didn't say it. I'm just repeating what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches. Now listen, here's what you have to understand. Because people say, well, that's not fair. How come he chose some? Everybody's guilty. In Adam, we sin. And because we sinned in Adam, we deserve death, eternal death. All, everybody, out of all those who are dying, God chose to save some. He could have saved all. Why didn't he? He chose not to. The Bible says he has much right to display his wrath as he does his mercy. See, wrath is an attribute of God. And so is mercy. We choose the attributes we like. I'll take a little love, a little mercy, a little grace, wrath, justice. Don't want those attributes. That's something, you know, God can give that to a different God or something. I don't want... No! And God chose in his love to save some. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not... I know people don't like it. But I'm not here to tell people what they like. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. That choosing, that choosing no, that, if that choosing was based on us, you, we'd never get chosen. God doesn't look out and say, look at what a great Christian John is. I'm going to choose him. I mean, he's a nice guy. He plays Santa Claus. He loves children. Yes, I'll choose John. No. He looked out and he says, whoa, that's a bad one. But I'll take him anyway. I'm bringing him in. He chose us. Nothing to do within ourselves. 